Amen. Good morning, guys. Man, you guys look awesome. Are you glad to be here? I know that you are. I'm so glad that you're here today. And, and uh, as Pastor Kevin said, that worship, so good. I didn't want to stop, but I know that, um, man, we can, we can connect with God through songs. We can ca- connect through scriptures, through prayer. We're going to do all those things this morning. Before I jump in, I have a lot to say today. But f- before I jump in, I know that I mentioned last year that we're going to be making some upgrades on the building. And, and uh, I wanted to give you guys a small update on that. That process has started. And we'll be making um, updates incrementally uh, throughout the year. So as you come in, you might see something that looks a little bit half done. And it could be that it is half done because we have to live here uh, while the upgrades are being made. Most of it in the beginning is going to be technology upgrades and um, new projectors and cameras and some things like that. Uh, But you will see some paint, some other things uh, as we progress through this. And um, if the Lord puts it on your heart to contribute to this project, make sure to come and talk to me. And I know that um, we can take all of that that you would like to sow and put that to good use right here in our building. I know that in 20 years from now, I want this building to be awesome and spectacular for your kids that are little right now. Can I get an amen, right? We want this place to be an awesome place for people to worship, not just today, but for 20 years from today. So, so just, uh, hey, we're going to be living in this together, and it's going to be good. I'm so excited. Aren't you excited about that? All right, you guys, a little bit, you guys are a little bit frozen today, but we're going to unthaw you, going to unthaw you. All right, we're going to jump right in. If you have your Bible this morning, there's a couple of places that we're going to be. We're going to be hanging out in James chapter 1. That will kind of be our, um, our home base for the next few weeks. And then we're going to be over in Philippians and Galatians. Or as always, you can just read on the screen behind me as we move through the information. We're going to start a new series today that I am super excited about. Um, As you can see on the screen, the title of the series is Religion Versus Me-Ligion. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about how this came to pass. A few years ago, I was at a writer's conference in Orlando, Florida. And I met a pastor there. Um, And he and I became really good friends. His name is Jamie Nunnally. And in fact, I'll be going to the church that he pastors in May to speak at a men's conference and also to stay over on Sunday morning and speak there at the main campus. But he was telling me about a book that he wanted to write called Me Ligion. And basically, it was about the temptation to make our faith or to make our walk with Jesus all about us. And as we were sitting there at breakfast talking about that, I said to him, if you don't write that book, I'm going to. Because this idea of me religion is something that is really um, interesting to me. And so over the next few weeks, we are going to build on some of the things that he and I talked about that day. But before we do, let's go ahead and get to a definition. So what is, what is me religion? Okay, we're going to go to the other side. There we go. Okay, so what is me religion? Me religion is faith in someone or something that is all about you. It is also a belief system that allows you to ask yourself how you feel about what God has already established as truth. And I want you guys to really latch onto that because that will be the main thought as we move through the next six, maybe seven weeks. Me religion. Now, let's talk about religion just for a moment. I know that being religious sometimes gets a bad rap. And it can be bad when you're talking about having a form of godliness or when you're talking about rules or talking about rituals. In fact, the Pharisees were very religious and Jesus often condemned them because they were so religious. But did you know that the Bible talks about a good kind of religion? Polly knows that. We're going to read the verse. It's found in James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 27 says, religion that... God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted from the world. Now look at that. He says this is the kind of religion that 
that pleases God, that you look after orphans and widows and that you keep yourself unpolluted from the world. If you look at the criteria for, for what it means to be biblically religious, you are not mentioned in that verse other than to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. When you boil it down, religion, that kind, the kind of religion that pleases God, according to that verse, is all about being holy and being helpful. Okay, So that's the good kind of religion. That's the kind that we're going to be looking for in this series. James talks about helping other people and about being holy as requirements for the kind of um, worship that God accepts. And so the question we should always be asking ourselves when it comes to our religion is this, are we holy and are we helpful? Those are the two things that, that, the, that James is giving us as examples here. And here, here, here's why, guys. True religion, the kind of religion that pleases God, is not about me at all. You know who it's about? It's about him and them. It's not about me, and it never was. And so don't get mad when I say it's not about you, because guess what? It's not about me either. James says the kind of religion that pleases God, it's about him and it's about them. It's about, fo it's about focusing, on our, focusing our lives on something other than ourselves, okay? And um, here's why that's important. Multiple studies have been done when it comes to unhappy, miserable people. And the most common trait when it comes to people who are unhappy isn't poverty, it isn't geography, it isn't their age, it isn't um, how healthy they are. The number one cause of misery is self-centeredness. That's the number one cause of mi misery. You know what that means? That means you can be healthy, you can be wealthy, you can live in a tropical paradise and still be miserable. Now, personally, I would like to test that hypothesis. <laughs> Anybody else out there like to give that a test, just to give it a try, just to make sure that it's true? But it's Solomon who, who looks around at his swimming pools and his orchards and his mansions and um, his orchestras that are playing music and his 1,000 sex partners, and he says, I hate my life. Right? So you... It's not about that. So all of these studies have just proven what God already knows. And what God already knows is that when life becomes about us, we become miserable people. And so if our faith, if our walk with Jesus becomes about us, then guess what's going to happen? The same thing. We're going to become miserable people. It won't matter um, where you go to church or um, who you're affiliated with spiritually, because if you're self-centered, you're always going to experience a certain level of, of unhappiness. And because God knows this about us, he has provided a way out. And it's our first point this morning. Number one is this. Christians are called to be Christ-centered, not self-centered. And the verse is um, found in Philippians chapter 2. We're going to go there together this morning. It says, abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interest. Anybody ever wrestle with that verse? Oh, come on. Don't look at me like that. I know you guys. Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interest. Such a powerful, powerful verse. He talks about that, that um, when you abandon, when you abandon selfishness, you're literally putting other people before yourself. Now let's look at another verse that I think is equally as important. It's found in Galatians. Um, oh, let's finish reading. And consider the example that Jesus, the anointed one, has set before us. Let his mindset become your motivation. Okay, now let's go on to the next one. The next one is Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ, 
And who, who no longer lives? I, right? It says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I love that verse because it's not that God is trying to kill me. He's not trying to kill me. He's trying to kill what used to motivate me by replacing it with Jesus. Now, why does he do that? He does that because Jesus does a much better job directing my life than I ever could. Got that? Now let's go to another one. It's found in Colossians. I want to get these verses out of the way so we can dig into this. It says, for you died. (laughs) Oh, my Lord. Is that news to you? (laughs) For you died. And your life is now hidden in Christ with God. And we see all of these verses have, have the same theme. And what's the theme? I really believe it's possible to die to sin by coming to Jesus for forgiveness, but at the same time, not fully dying to self. I've personally been dead to sin, but not dead to self. Anyone else? Okay. Erasing sin is completely a work of the Holy Spirit, but erasing self is you working hand in hand with the Holy Spirit. And I say that for a reason, guys. Self is a monster. And when you are focused on yourself, you know what? You're going to be in a bad mood a lot. Oh, come on. Some of you, you got to get this, right? I'm not saying you're in a bad mood, but there are people around you who are in a bad mood, and now you know why. Anybody else would agree that self is a monster? It is a monster. And and when you're focused on yourself, you're going to be in a bad mood a lot. Look, Look at the way Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 puts this. I'm not going to go back there, but... In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, it says, it is no longer I, but Christ. You know what? That should be your personal mission statement over your life. It is no longer I, but Christ. However, the enemy wants you to make your mission statement, it is no longer Christ, but I. And so every day when you get out of bed and your feet hit the floor, you get to decide if it's going to be you or if it's going to be Christ. Every single day you get to decide. That's God's gift to you. Now, I could tell you there are times when, you know, I don't want to forgive people. But if I live as a dead man, then the Christ who lives in me can rise up and help me forgive that person. And that can apply really to any behavior that you have going on in your life. We're going to talk a lot more about this next week, but in the Old Testament, they often, they often um, worshipped gods that they fashioned themselves. And as I think through that process a little bit, I don't want to be the person who, who worships what I fashion. I want to fashion my life around the God that I worship. And that means that there's a lot of dying that I'm going to have to do. And you know what? I'm okay with this, guys. You know why I'm okay with this? Because I make a terrible God. Now, you may make a great God. But I make a terrible God. And so I don't want a life that, that, that I fashion. I want a life that's already been fashioned by the God of heaven. And then I partner with that life. It, it's a daily walking it out to, to allow God to be God. H- have you ever had a circumstance in your life where you wanted to be God because you thought you could handle it better than the way God was handling it? I see a few hands that go up out there. Of course. We all, we all have been in those situations where we're going to have to decide, is it going to be I or is it going to be Christ? Am I going to do what I want to do or am I going to do what God is telling me to do? Now, you guys know this about me. You know that I'm pretty particular about the truck that I drive and I'm that way, and you, you, 
if you've known me for very long, you already know this. I'm that way because I see myself as a steward. I don't own anything. Everything that I have belongs to God, and I'm just taking care of it until it's time for me to go to heaven. And I'm really particular about my truck, and it's not even because it's new. I feel the same way about my 20-year-old farm truck. And Paul just put a new motor in my farm truck. And what did the inside of that farm truck look like, Paul? Immaculate. It was immaculate. You know why? I, and I, I, I don't know why I get emotional about this, but I just can't, I just can't let God's truck be dirty. Like, I just can't see trash being in God's truck. And people think I'm really anal, and I am. <laughs> but I got to tell you, some of it's just conviction. I mean, I'm just convicted by it. I'm, I, and it's not just my truck. I'm that way with every area of life. Like, I can't imagine, you know, like God's shed being dis, dis, out of, you know, being in disorder. Like, I, I just see myself that way. So I'm really particular about my truck or God's truck that I get to drive in. And so... Um, one day I said all that to say this one day, I, I, a couple, it's been a couple years ago. I was at Walmart and, um, I had just put on my, you know, like my best pajama pants to go in and no, no, um, no, I was at Walmart and, um, it was, it was, it was raining. It was raining really hard and it was, uh, it was in the fall and it was cool outside and I, I'm coming through the parking lot, and there's a man standing at the crosswalk to go from the store out to the parking lot. So I pull up to the crosswalk. I'm standing there, or I'm sitting there in my truck, and um, it's pouring down rain. And the man is just standing there. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, he's going to go. Okay, he's going to go. Okay, he's going to go. He doesn't go. It seemed to me like it was five minutes that passed. I'm sure it was only you know, maybe a minute at the very most, and he doesn't go. And so I think, okay, well, maybe he's going to, someone's coming to pick him up. So he just stands there, and he doesn't go. So I'm like, okay, you know, I can't help you, guy. I'm going. So just about the time I start to go, he starts to walk, and it looks like I sat there the entire time waiting for him to go, and then I cut him off. <laughs> That's how it looked. So as I'm driving, so as I'm driving by him, he opens up his hand like this and he slaps the side of my, the side of God's truck. And it bangs really loud. And so I slammed on the brakes and I shoved it up into park. And you know, you've heard of, you know, fight or flight. I, I'm a fight guy. I'm just saying. I am. I, I'm sorry about it. Um, but in my mind, I was thinking to myself, he is going to pay because he just slapped God's truck. And I went for the door handle. And in that moment, I promise you, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, Larry, it's not worth it. Just go. And I start arguing. I'm like, yeah, but it's God's truck. And it's like, Larry, it's not worth it. Just put the truck back in drive and go. And so I shot him. No, I didn't. Um, I, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, um, I put the truck back in park and I went, but I had a decision, not backwards over the top of him. I went forward. Okay. But in that decision I had to make, or in that moment I had to make a decision, was it going to be no longer I but Christ, or was it going to be no longer Christ but I? And you know what? Every day you've got to make that decision. Because every day there are going to be people that are irritating you and people that are doing things that deserve, that deserve a good Walmart butt whooping. But just because they deserve it doesn't mean that God has left you in charge of taking care of the vengeance in your life. And so we have to decide, is our walk with God going to be about Jesus or is our walk with God going to be about us? Someone said Jesus. Who was it? It was a little kid. Awesome. 
So, all right, so here, here we go. We got all that in to, to get to the first point. The number one, number one, here we go, symptoms. Let's talk about some symptoms today of being religious, okay? This is how you know that you have religion, not religion, the kind of religion that pleases God. Number one is this, your spiritual disciplines only benefit you. So what is a spiritual discipline? Okay, that's not the right one. Um, I'm going to go back over here. What is a spiritual discipline? Um, a spiritual discipline is this. It's a spiritual activity that you do in order to grow in your walk with Jesus. That's a spiritual discipline. So what would a spiritual discipline be? It would be um, um, something like Bible study, prayer, um, going to church, serving, um, family church university, worship, fellowship, giving. All of these things are spiritual disciplines. So if you have religion, your spiritual disciplines only benefit you. What I'm trying to say is if all you do is what feels comfortable and easy, where you're not being stretched, where you're not being poured out, then your spiritual disciplines are more about you than they are about anything else. If you ignore certain books or certain chapters in the Bible because they contradict how you're living, then your spiritual disciplines are more focused on you than they are growing closer to Jesus. I don't have time to read all of it, but the Pharisees had a lot of spiritual disciplines. And one of the stories that I think is just super interesting is found in Matthew chapter 23. And Jesus is addressing the Pharisees and he says, he says to them, he said, he said, you guys tithe on the plants that you grow in your garden, but you don't walk in love and you don't display mercy and you don't live in integrity. Think about that. He's like, you, you're tithing on the plants that you grow in your garden, but you're not living in a way that honors God. What was he saying? He was saying your walk with God is about you. And I want you to think about your own life just for a second. What parts of your walk with God are about you? You get mad when we don't sing the songs that you like? You get mad when you know, you hear a sermon on stewardship or tithing and you're like, well, I, I'm not going to do that because that's just not my thing. I mean, what, what parts of your walk with God are about you? You know, you, you might really enjoy serving on the guest experience team, and I hope that you do because we need you. But how about this? How about every other month go serve in the toddler nursery? What I'm saying this morning is stretch yourself, pour yourself out, give it all that you've got. And you know why? He's worth it, guys. Introduce some spiritual disciplines into your life this year that make you grow, make you nervous, make you a little bit scared, and make you want to throw up. You know why? He's worth it, guys. He's worth it. So when it comes to serving at the church, you know, do you ever catch yourself saying, well, that's really not my thing. If you ever said that, that's the area where you need to go sign up today. Now, I've kind of changed my mind on that a little bit. I used to be of the opinion that if you don't want to be there, we don't want you there. But if we don't ever put you there, then how are you ever going to be stretched or grown? Right? How are you ever going to stretch or grow, right? So you know you have religion when, when church life and, and, and spiritual life and, and the things that revolve around your relationship with Jesus are really just all about you and what makes you comfortable and what you enjoy. Are you guys, you, you with me? Okay, I thought maybe you wish you were staying at home today or well, you went fishing or something, but... If you go fishing, I'll go with you. But, man, these spiritual disciplines, I got to tell you, I, you know, there, yeah, there are things that I would rather do sometimes than, you know, be in my prayer closet praying and spending time with God. I'm just being honest. You know, I don't feel like it every day. 
If you do, then you can teach next Sunday. I don't feel like it every day. There are a few spiritual disciplines that I have to really be intentional about. Why? Because I don't want to be me religious. I don't want my relationship with God just to be all about me, okay? So that's the number one. Your spiritual disciplines only benefit you. The second symptom of being me religious is this. The sins of others are a bigger deal to you than your own sins. And that's the verse that we have here. Now, I want you to, to um, think about who wrote this. This is the Apostle Paul. And you got you to gotta know, this guy, Paul, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Um, I'm guessing none of you guys have ever written any of the Bible. Okay? So this guy's pretty spiritual, you think? Okay? Church planter, you know, just a, an apostle, an amazing guy. And he says, I can testify that the word is true and deserves to be received by all. For Jesus Christ came into the world to bring bring sinners back to life, even me, the worst sinner of all. Hmm. This would be the guy. We would think of him like the Pope. I mean, you know, without the goofy hat. We would think of this guy as this spiritual giant, this person that we could never, ever, ever measure up to. This guy that was just beyond us when it comes to their relationship with with God. I mean, this is a guy who's seen Jesus with his eyes on the road to Damascus. I mean, this this guy is serious. And he says, talking about himself, he says, I am the worst sinner of all. Do you ever look at the sins of others and think that they are worse than your sins? Well, spoiler alert, they're not. And I know that some sins carry, you know, a heavier consequence on the earth and in your life, and rightfully so. But sin on its own is all the same in the eyes of God. And I will add this, this caveat, okay? If you're a leader in the church, the Bible is clear that you will receive a harsher judgment for sin, okay? It's clear. And that's why Paul said, not many of you should desire to be teachers. Another caveat I'll add is this. People who indulge in sexual sin also receive a stricter judgment because the Bible says they're sinning against their own bodies, okay? So the wages of sin is death. The more you sin, the the more good things in your life are gonna die. But what I'm talking about this morning is the belief that you are morally superior And you know what? A person who struggles with pride, for example, is usually the last person to know and the first person to point out the sins of other people. Jesus talked a lot about this. And one time he said, Jesus said, why are you trying to get the speck out of your brother's eye when you have a log in your own eye? And here's here's the best way I know how to to illustrate this, okay? So when you're you're religious, the kind of religion that, that God accepts... You see the Bible as a mirror. So you look in the mirror and you're like, you know, making sure you don't got any spinach in your teeth. You know, you're looking into the scriptures, making sure you don't have, you know, like it's, it's, you're looking at yourself. You're, you're, you're making sure that, you know, there's no crust in your eyes, you know, all the things, everything is the way that it should be, right? Right. You see the Bible as a mirror. You not only see Jesus in there, but when you're reading the Bible, you're looking at it with the eye to, okay, what about me needs to be fixed and changed? You guys follow? So you're looking at the Bible like a mirror, like, okay, what about me? What needs to be fixed and changed? That's, that's how it's supposed to work. Now, if you're me you treat the Bible like a pair of binoculars, Okay? So you're, you got your, you know, you got your binoculars out and you're just like looking and you're just scanning, like you're just scanning your, your church family. And then you're just like, oh my Lord, look at all the sin in Lori. <laughs> and then you're messing with it a little bit because you got to get it focused better. 
because you really got to be able to see what's going on in Lori's life, right? So you're just looking at Lori, looking at Lori to see all the sin that's in Lori. And then here's how you know you're really religious, okay? Randy, come up here for a second. Come up here, have a seat by me, okay? This is how you know you're really religious. Hey, check out the sin in Lori. Oh, you see it. You see all that sin oh, over there? Highlighted. What do you think we should do about it? Maybe we, about it. we could, we could like post, we could be really vague and post something on Facebook <laughs> about Lori, but we won't mention her name, but we could allude to the fact that it's her and everybody else will know. What do you think about that? See, he's agreeable, right? That's how you know. I know maybe we could call up some of Lori's friends and invite them out for coffee. And then we could talk about Lori and how horrible she is. What do you think about that? And then you can buy the coffee. No? Ah. So, all right, you can go sit down. But you're still buying the coffee. Okay. So, um, so when you're me religious, when your relationship with God it's all about you. You don't treat the Bible like a mirror. You don't look into the scripture to see what's wrong with you. You treat the Bible like a pair of binoculars so that you can look and see what's wrong with everybody else. Are you following me this morning? Okay, I, I hoped and believed that you were. All right. Now, now I want to I be very clear because I'm not saying that we don't hold each other accountable. And I want to read a verse that's found in Galatians. Um, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, My beloved friends, if you see a believer who is overtaken with a fault, may the one who overflows with the Spirit seek to restore him, win him over with gentle words, which will open his heart to you and will keep you from exalting yourself over him. Okay, now that's a verse that we don't always read. Um, but it's so, it's so good um, because he's talking about how that, that when you do see someone who is overtaken with the fault, that you go to them in love so that you can restore them back to their relationship with God. And so I'm not talking about that this morning. Now, let's move on. The third, the third symptom of being me religious today is this. You get mad when God doesn't do what you thought he was going to do. You get mad when God doesn't do what you thought he was going to do. Because, guys, listen, this whole timing issue throws a lot of people off. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 says, Don't allow yourselves to be weary or disheartened in planting good seeds. For the season of reaping the wonderful harvest you've planted is coming. Okay? So he's talking here about, you know, trusting God with all the, the timing issues in your life. So here's the question. What you do, or, or maybe what do you do when God isn't doing what you want him to do? Isn't that a good question? What do you do when God isn't doing what you want him to do? I heard it over there. Here's what you do. You give it time, and in the meantime, you be a blessing. What, do, what are you talking about, be a blessing? What do... Um, what do waiters do? Serve. There you go, right there. You serve. If you're a waiter, <laughs> then you serve. And when you're a waiter, when it comes to whatever it is that you're believing God to do, you serve. And here's why. Okay, guys, this is the deal right here. This is where it's at, okay? Make sure your faith is tied to a relationship with God and not a result from God. You follow? That's why we stick it out. Because we want to make sure that our faith is tied to a relationship with God, not a result from God. God wants to be with you, not just do for you. So your faith can't be in what he does or in what he doesn't do. Your faith has to be in who he is, right? Now we're going to do one more, and this is not going to take very long. Number four, the fourth symptom of being religious is this. Your life is cluttered with confusion, disorder, and chaos. 
Now, I, I say that because of one verse, James chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there's our, there's our selfishness again, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. Now, that word disorder in the Greek actually means chaos and, and it means confusion. Now, don't get me wrong. There will be seasons in your life that are a little bit more chaotic than others, especially if you have small children. I get that. But he's saying here that one of the symptoms of being religious or being self-centered is that your life is characterized by chaos and confusion. Um, does anyone here have what is called a junk drawer? Anybody got that? Oh, man, a couple. You got, you got a junk drawer? A storage unit, uh, a few things like that. Okay. At our house, we have this thing called the junk drawer. And do you know what is in the junk drawer? I'm glad because I don't know. No, you look in there and there'll be a charger from like 1994 for my Nokia phone. There's probably some batteries, maybe... Um, I don't know, some Sharpies, uh, paper clips, rubber bands, um, you know, like uh, uh, the severed head of my enemy. I don't know. I mean, there's lots of things in there. Hey, David kept the head of Goliath in his backpack. What do you guys? Oh, never mind. There's lots of things in there that are just kind of, they're just kind of all in there. And, and you know what, guys, listen, your life should not look like an upside down junk drawer. He talks about selfishness and when the end game is all about you, that's me religion. And you know what it creates? It creates a turned upside down life. And when you get like this, God is not punishing you, you are punishing you. And sometimes we blame the devil for stuff that we created through me religion. When it becomes more about self than savior, you know what's gonna happen? Your life is gonna get turned upside down. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna stop right there. And I, I want you guys to stand with me and I'm gonna have the, the band come back and, and I'm gonna have the prayer team come back this morning. And you know, I really hope that the heart of what I was trying to communicate came out because I want you to know that we're all in this together. And so when I say that it's not about you, you know what else that I'm saying? I'm also saying it's not about me, right? So I don't live by a different set of rules than you live by. It's all the same. It's all, we're all in this boat together, guys. And we can't afford to allow our relationship with God to become about us. We can't. We, we have to crucify um, ourselves and we have to take up our cross and we have to die daily and we have to follow Jesus. And I said it earlier, I'm going to say it again. And you know why, guys? It's because he's worth it. He's worth it. And so that means there's a certain, there's a certain amount of dying that I have to submit to. And I don't like it. But I know that it's needful and I know it's necessary because I want it to be Christ in me, um, not me in me. Because again, I make a terrible God. And I, I can't always trust me, but I can trust Jesus. And he's never going to lead me astray or steer me wrong or any of those things. And so, so I put my faith and my hope completely in him. So this morning, if you would, just bow your heads, maybe close your eyes. And I want you to just shut yourself off from everything. And I want you to think about this message just for a moment. And I want you to think about maybe um, an area of your relationship with God that maybe it has started to become more about you than it is about Jesus or about others. Remember what James said? He said, religion that, that pleases God. He said, it's about, it's about um, taking care of orphans and widows. You know, that's them, that's everybody else that's out there. And he said, it's about keeping yourself from being unpolluted 
by the world. So that's talking about your relationship with him. You know, like, it's, so it's, it's him and them. That's the kind of religion that pleases God. So I want you to think about your walk and your life and kind of where you are right now in your spiritual journey. And if there are some course corrections that need to be made here, um, this is a great time for you to do that. And whether it's, um, you know, like your spiritual disciplines have become more about you or whether it's um, the sin of others um, has become a bigger deal to you uh, than your own sins or, uh, you know, it could be that your life is just characterized by chaos and confusion right now. I don't know. It, it could be a lot of the stuff, but, but it doesn't matter what it's been. Only, the only thing that matters is where it's going from this point forward, okay? And so you can talk to God about it and I'll let you in on a secret. He already knows. So you can talk to God about it this morning and he'll help you and he'll help you to crucify your flesh. He'll help you uh, to put that part of your life um, under the blood of Jesus and he'll give you the tools that you need for a better path. And he, he longs to do that right now. So um, the band is gonna come back and we're gonna sing this one last song together. And if you're here today and you're just like, you know what, Larry, that message just wrecked my heart. It connected with me uh, because there are some areas of my life where I tend to bleed over into self-centeredness. And I want to be, I want to, I want to come back to, to, to that Christ-centered walk. And um, I want all that selfishness to just um go in Jesus name. It just needs to go. And, and I know that I'm going to need supernatural help for that to happen. And you know what, guys, you're in a great place. You're in a great place. And, and number one, first of all, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your savior, um, that's the number one thing we got to take care of today. Jesus loves you. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And all you have to do is come to him with those sins and ask him to forgive you of those sins and then um, invite him to be the Lord of your new life, your life apart from, from that old sinful life that you're leaving behind. And you know what? You're not gonna get it all figured out today, but you will get it figured out and the Holy Spirit will move inside of you and things will change. But that's where it starts. And then after that, you know, that's when, you know, we, we, we tend to, to drift into those areas of selfishness. And that's where we have, to, we have to come and we have to say, Lord, kill that, kill that in me and, um, and raise up the, 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 the spirit of Jesus who lives in me uh, to, to, be that, uh, to be that centerpiece, to be that, that you know, that one thing that, that decides everything. And so if you're here today and any of that fits you, or maybe you're just sick and going through some problems or you need a job or you need some financial help and you're believing God for a miracle there, whatever you need, this altar is safe. It's good. It's a wonderful place. And um, we should always feel safe in the altar. So if you're here today and you need prayer, go ahead and come. And um, if not, then I want you to just sing. I want you to connect with the Father. Um, I want you to spend some time with Jesus today before we let you go.